Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, and many others. What was your initial reaction when um, seeing the back-to-back -back videos of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile? Check, all right. Can y'all hear me? Y'all can hear me up top here? No? Okay, I hear you, okay. Okay, my name's Fumi Lola Fadwamila. I'm one of the original members of the Black Lives Matter movement, just to give some context so you all know exactly what a point of view I'm coming from. Um, Black Lives Matter started here in Los Angeles in summer of 2013, three years ago, and the LA chapter was the first chapter. And so you just asked me, how do I feel about Philando, about Alton Sterling and Philando Castile and how um, these events happen continuously, right? So we're seeing videos of black people being killed by the police. And I think the only way that I could describe it immediately would be kind of traumatically unsurprising. And so I say it's traumatic because it's traumatic anytime that innocent people are killed by police for absolutely no reason, correct? For being black, for example in being black. But it's also, in many ways, unsurprising because we understand the history of this country. We understand the history of anti-black racism in this country. And so I say that it is both traumatic and unsurprising, but we need to be surprised every time that it happens. Why do I say that? Because if we're not surprised when black people are killed by the police and we witness it on video, then we normalize it in our minds. Does that make sense? it becomes normalized. And when it's normalized, we do not react in the same ways that we would. As if it's just part of everyday life. Oh, you know, black people get picked off by the police, but we know this to be rea a reality in our lives, in black communities. And so why I say that we need to be surprised 
surprises so that it doesn't become so normalized in our psyches that we do not respond and feel the need to resist when black people are attacked by the state and agents of the state, which are the police, um, police officers, right? No, thank you for that. And when the footage, <laughs> and, um, when the footage um, you know, released back to back, um, media surrounding peers from different backgrounds and essentially the whole world began to actively speak on something as Lola mentioned has been an existing issue for so long. And through Philando's footage being streamed via Facebook Live and all of us having the ability to, to film these incidents through our, our mobile devices, um, social media and technology really have become an essential role to activism as a whole and increasing awareness. Um, that's great, but now you know the next step and question is how to mobilize effectively and um, how to really achieve social change. So I want to address this to Steve and Juhan. Based on your respective backgrounds um, in the brand strategy and social media marketing spaces, how effective do you believe social media activism really is? And how can we avoid the habit of confining this reoccurring issue into just a hashtag or a trending topic and instead encourage an ongoing conversation in order to gain a deeper awareness and understanding um, ultimately with the goal to move towards tangible solutions? I think that we need to continue. Conversations and panels like this are important because we need to keep the conversation going. And I like that you guys touched on the fact that it's become normalized. Even through the media, we've been desensitized to violence. So when we see these people, the young woman who was sitting next to her boyfriend who had been murdered, she was so calm. And I commend her for being articulate and calm, but at the same time, she was a product of being desensitized through media. You guys understand what I'm saying? So I think panels like this are important to keep the conversation going so that we don't relegate those lives to just becoming another hashtag and then we move on with life. So I think it's important to do panels and events like this, but I also think it's important to have small groups amongst your friends, your peers, to talk about what's going on, how does this affect us, and then partner with people like Black Lives Matter and Lola, who already put agenda policies together that we can band behind and use our voice to amplify the message. So that's my thought on that question. Um, my take on it as far as uh, I guess being considered a social media influencer, I uh, have to take it upon myself to utilize my voice and not be silent um, because I do have a lot of people that listen um, but I have to somehow in my duty as comedy to, to make light of the situation but also speak knowledge on the situation um, be responsible and, and encourage people not to uh, be aggressive and, and, and make the wrong choices about the situation um, I would I preach nonviolence you know because Getting angry about the situation and going and attacking the cops doesn't do anything but instill fear in the cops, which is already instilled into black folks, which causes a, like a, a spread of a war, which is what we don't need at this time. Um, but the, I think the biggest responsibility with uh, social media is just to kind of, like you said, it's not a hashtag. Talk about it, address it, and try to find a solution to it. Thank you. And Lola, do you feel that social media has played an essential part in increasing Black Lives Matter's profile, yet at the same time, um, do you see a correlation of attacks on the organization, especially after these videos exposing police brutality um, go viral? For example, I don't know if, if everyone's aware, but the WNBA was recently fined because um, several teams wore shirts that said Black Lives Matter, and they were fined for that. Or, you know, the Dallas cops' police um, deaths, they, automatically people blamed Black Lives Matter right after that. So how do you take that? Okay, did everybody hear her question? The first part was about the social media. I just want to make sure, okay. Um, how has social media played a role in the development of Black Lives Matter as an organization? Black Lives Matter, the slogan was birthed on social media, on Facebook. Um, and from there, the slogan was taken to the streets, put on um, posters, put on picket 
signs as protesters and activists in the community um, were resisting the acquittal of George Zimmerman in summer of 2013, who killed, of course, Trayvon Martin. And so it would be an understatement to say that social media has influenced the Black Lives Matter movement. I, I want to say, I want to say plainly that the Black Lives Matter movement would not exist without the push of social media. Um, and so there's oftentimes this kind of like 50-50 critique about social media, particularly with our generation, right? The young generation is that we engage social media to the point that we cannot get off of social media and do something in our communities interpersonally, physically. But then the other part of the um, coin is that we use social media to connect with each other, to spread information, and to actually mobilize people, to get people to come to one specific place to engage in one specific action. And so we always have to understand that there's complexity with these things. Social media is a complex phenomenon that if not used wisely, can separate us just as much as it can connect us. But I think, for the most part, we've used social media in a very, in a beneficial way, in a smart way. You know, we have comedians like Brother Here who does speak on issues, and also we need to be able to laugh. We need to be able to come together, organize, strategize, talk about the issues, talk about white, white racism, white supremacy, patriarchy, all of these kind of terms that make people uncomfortable sometimes, right? But we need to be able to talk about those things, and we also need to be able to wake up in the day and smile and laugh, because when we are not happy, when we give up our joy, when we give up, when we give up our being outside of just being people that are repressed by the state, then you lose your humanity, and in that, you are engaging in the operation in which the people that do not seek you well are trying to facilitate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um. And there was the second part of the question about attacks that on Black Lives Matter specifically. We are living in a sensitive time, right? We're living in a time where people are trying to figure out what to do about black people being targeted by not only police officers, but by generally state violence. And that comes in the form of inadequate public education, right? That comes in many different forms, aside from actually the police just targeting black people. So, too long-winded because I can actually, I'll, I'll go on this forever. Let me just rewind it back and get out of professor mode. Okay, BLM gets attacked um, quite a bit, specifically now because of what happened in Dallas. Now, I can just say on the record that BLM has nothing to do with what happened in Dallas. Okay, that's, that's something that is like uh, easy to understand that BLM was formed by, for the most part, um, unarmed women of color that want to counteract violence in our communities, not inflict more violence, right? And so we understand that in achieving the goal of black people being able to live full and fruitful lives will not, um, will not be fulfilled by killing police officers. And so, long story short, we know the history of um, black struggle movements being vilified in the media as, and criminalized as people that want to inflict harm when in actuality we are just actually fighting for the lives of people. And so long story short, we have to resist every urge to take in those media representations, mainstream negative media representations of BLM, because the goal behind that is to make it very uncomfortable for people to affiliate with BLM. If BLM is characterized as cop killers, it's very uncomfortable for people to affiliate with BLM, when in actuality, BLM is looking to find answers about how we can change this world and keep everyone safe, happy, alive, and thriving. And as
as most of you may know, O'Shea is a huge sports fan, sports guru uh, to be very specific. And as you know, O'Shea, teams aim to create this culture of accountability. So that means for oneself, for one's teammate, um, and this is believed to be a huge factor in achieving a successful season for any sport that is played and regard, you know, needs a team pretty much. So how can we apply the same concept of accountability in order to mold a more cohesive culture within our shared communities despite the different backgrounds and what does accountability look like when it comes to battling institutionalized racism? No problem. Um, well, you know, when it, when it comes to a, a, a team sport, everybody on the team, everybody who's considered a teammate, you know, they all have the same common goal. And once that's established, once the, you know, math is the universal language, once the, the common denominator, all right, once that common goal is found, then that, that's when you can start piecing things together. Straight out of Compton is just about five friends who all had the same idea who put it together. And you know what, that, that alone, you know, just five dudes, you know, they changed the world. So just imagine what 15, what 30, what, what 60 people could do. And you know, when it comes to the, the institution, that's where the whole team aspect kind of goes out the window. Because the, the institution is not a, it's not a team sport. You know, they, they built it for it to be, uh, and when I say they, I mean the higher-ups. They built it so it's a, it's a race. It's a constant race. We're in constant competition. I got to be better than this dude. I got to be better. Like, this. it's always that. And that builds the, the haterism. You know, the, the, those, those cliche things that we've all had to deal with that are annoying, that seem pointless because they are. You know, once you realize, once you establish that common goal and that common denominator and realize that everybody around you, everybody is of blood and flesh trying to survive, you know, that's when things look a little bit, a little less complicated. And it, it really doesn't need to be. It. When you got people playing the game, playing the race, and there's so many other sub-genres going on underlining your main idea, how could you ever reach your destination? You have so many people playing opposite games. You've got colleges who will drop you, you know, who will pick you up. You're, you may be excellent at your major, but if you don't get them GEs, we go drop you. Because those GEs help that college get its numbers. And so SC is better than UCLA or, you know, whatever it is, whatever the school it is, they, it's about them getting their numbers up. So they can send you the letter and the package and all that, the shirts, and tell you, yeah, I believe in you. But if you don't do these GEs, if you don't jump through these hoops, which is not even the reason why I'm paying to go to college, then I, I, I give up on you. That, that's, the, that's a separate game that they're playing that's being detrimental to, to society. And, and it's so many of those throughout anybody's workplace, anybody's workforce. It's just there's always somebody trying to use you as a pawn instead of just realizing that we're all just rats in a rat race. And going back to Steve, Juhan, and Lola, who do you believe we should hold accountable and how do we hold them accountable? Uh, you don't have a mic like yet. Policy makers. I believe, it's, I believe in marching. I believe in social media. It's like the new campaign or publicity, if you will, to let people know there's a problem. So social media is important. Marching is important because it identifies that there is a problem. But after that, I believe, and I'm going to turn it over to Black Lives Matter, but I believe that the next best long-term solution is policy, and policy is simply defined as the guidelines by which the government is run. And we need to figure out how to band together to reform policy or to create new policy. And something that I've been studying is um, the Ground Zero campaign, which gives you 10 points of policy that we can, we can even help to deal with how the police come into our community and teach them on training on how to deal with us so that they're not threatened by us. Because the reality is we're the ones who need to feel threatened with what's going on in the media, but that's another story for another day. Real quick, I also wanted to touch on the fact of how the media is is spinning. I market movies for a living. I did the movie Creed. I did the show Empire. 
I wanted to get on Compton, but they didn't hire me, bro. We can talk about that at another time. But the point is, yes, the Here Black Lives Matter is a positive movement formed by, you said, African-American women who were just trying to work against violence. And the media's job is to put a spin on a negative connotation on that. That's why we have a responsibility as social media posters, as whatever your level of influence is, just because you're not on the stage doesn't mean you don't have influence. We all have a responsibility, so make sure that we're promoting love and unity and not giving any more reasons why the media can turn Black Lives Matter negative because there's such a negative spin on that right now and it's not fair. So I just wanted to get that out there. Turn it over to me. I would have to agree. Um, we absolutely need to hold policy makers accountable and on the other end of that in many ways and I say this and I say this with some amount of caution that we also need to hold ourselves accountable to show up for each other, to show up. Now, let me talk about the policy makers specifically before I get to us. Um, I think that people generally get overwhelmed when we talk about what it means to address policy on a national scale, because this is a national problem. If we want to talk about anti-black racism, this is a global problem. We know this to be true, correct? Um, but here in America, we have a judicial system that has proven itself to be to be inadequate in addressing justice, in bringing about justice. We know this to be true. We, we see people murdered and we see a lack of accountability. We see people poisoned in Flint and we see a lack of accountability for these black and brown people's lives. So what does that mean then? Who do we hold accountable? Do we talk to Barack Obama? What do we say to Barack Obama when we talk to Barack Obama? Let's talk about locally, because nationally tends to, and I don't mean this in any type of condescending way, but tends to overwhelm. And so let's talk about what people can do locally. Check, check, okay. We're in LA. The Los Angeles, now we're talking about Black Lives Matter, and a large part of the conversation is police brutality. In Los Angeles, we have, I'm not talking about one of the most murderous, and I don't know if y'all know this, we have the most murderous police department in the nation. This is not something that is a popular information. For the most part, LAPD is in many ways glorified and upheld as a police department that does well in this nation, but actually is one of the highest in terms of numbers of killings annually, particularly of black and brown people. Um, so Black Lives Matter LA, if I can just talk about a bit of a, some of our efforts, is right now critiquing the Los Angeles Police Department locally and calling for the firing of Charlie Beck. Charlie Beck is the chief of police for LAPD. So I want to talk about a little bit, before going too much, about specifically what's happening here in LA. We're traumatized by what happened with Alton Sterling. We're traumatized about what happened with Philando Castile. We're traumatized about Sandra Bland. We're traumatized about Eric Garner. We're traumatized about Mike Brown. But we don't have the video footage of Ezell Ford in Los Angeles, a mentally ill man who was shot by police when the in his own neighborhood, when the people in the neighborhood were telling the police, please leave him alone. This is his neighborhood. We know who he is. He is not of any harm to anyone. And um, still, dead. We have Riddell Jones, whose killer in Los Angeles was just let off in terms of um, their um, actions were found in policy. This was a woman who was shot several times in the back and by the police, a black woman in an alley in this neighborhood down the street. But we don't know it because the video footage is not viral like Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. So I say all of that to say, once I said before getting long-winded, is that let's think a little bit more locally about what we can do in LA and also uh, have a conversation about what's happening, happening um, nationally. And very briefly, because I think that I see it's almost time. Very briefly, I'm not a celebrity, but I work with celebrities. So this past week, I called Cedric the Entertainer and Megan Good and Devon Franklin and Omar Epps and Marlon Wayans, and we got together 
privately. We're not going to talk about what we talked about, but we have made a decision to get behind Black Lives Matter and other institutions like Color of Change to use that collective celebrity voice so that we can amplify the message. So this past Sunday, we showed up for that local effort at occupying City Hall. And because I got those celebrities to show up, then the media showed up, which then brings our local issues to a national level. So I want you to know on behalf of all the celebrities that you see on TV, we had 150 people, T.I. was there, the game, all trying to figure out what they can do to help this. So if you didn't hear anything else, know that those people are supporting you behind the scenes. And one last thing, when we say Black Lives Matter, it doesn't mean a white life doesn't matter, but it means we matter too. So make sure when you're talking, to your people about policy, whatever you took away from this panel, that people understand. We're not saying we're better than, we're just saying we want to feel that equality, that justice for all that was promised to us, just like the next man. Yes, thank you. And um, we have one, room for one last question, and um, so this is for O'Shea. As many, if not all of us, can agree, um, you did an amazing performance in Straight Outta Compton, and it's interesting because NWA <laughs> served as a catalyst that sparked a movement that still resounds till this day. Did portraying your father, specifically in the scenes where he experienced police brutality as an NWA member, influence your views and your reaction to the recent events? Oh no, it, it, you know everything else prior to. My father's existence probably would lead me to the same result. You know, it's, it's something that's been going on for so long. Uh, you know, internet just got here. It, it, it's been happening for so long. There's so many, so many stories that you can go through that, you know, some event, events here in the States, it's, it's part of the history. You know, it, it's, it's part of the, the, the reach. You know, all the, all the, the documents that talk about you know, the, the equality of man, I was considered three-fourths of a human being. You know, I wasn't necessarily considered in this document. So, it, it, NWA worked as the social media before the internet. You know, there were so many people in other neighborhoods that didn't know that, oh, this is happening to you as well. And that's what really starts the uproars once they find that common denominator. You know, once that, that climbs back into the, in, into the equation. And with social media and with, with celebrities, you have to use that light, no matter if it's for a superficial reason why people have their eyes on you. But you have to use that light because you never know who's listening, who's paying attention. There's people here right now, I'm sure everybody hear me, but I don't know how many people are listening. All right, and the people who listen are the people who are affected. I'm gonna give you all a couple of quotes before we get out of here, but it's stuff I heard my whole life. If you throw a rock in a room full of dogs, the only dog that should bark is the one that got hit. So if you're just throwing out positivity, inspiration, it may go through one ear and out the other, but that one person, that one dog, is go bark. And that's who it was for. That's who that message was for. That's who it was meant to be. You always have to take the opportunity to be real with the people. And, you know, uh, as far as, like, the community, things that we can do as a community to, to, to advance is volunteer work, honestly. You know, for, uh, if, you, if you're so focused, a lot of the people during the Civil Rights Movement, they knew that the things that they went through wouldn't give them change that day. I'm doing this for the people that come after me. So don't, I know that you, you want a quick reward for your sacrifice. But we're at a point where schools are taking out art programs. And we as a people, you know, if it's not the mic or the, or the ball, we don't know how to, you know, really create anything for ourselves. So those of us that do have an outer knowledge or a knowledge of the judicial system or the, or, or engineering, anything like that. You have to give give out free classes to the community. You know, they don't know what's out there if you keep showing them the same, I was about to cuss, if you keep showing them the same things. You know, you, you, you have to, to bite the bullet. Big Sean is a, you know, he's, he's one of my favorite artists right now because he built a studio in his high school called the Sean Anderson School of Infinite Possibilities. And if everybody took the time to give knowledge, just give knowledge, you never know what's gonna be the spark to somebody's fire. And people need to take in how honorable it should be to inspire another human being to be great. Because if it's, if it's just about you, 
that ain't gonna help the rest of us. So, you know, I want everybody who's affected by the things that's been going on, the people who feel like, you know, their backs are against the wall, I'm gonna give y'all two quotes that I want the people listening to take this with them. Even though I can't control the direction of the wind, I can always adjust my sails to reach my destination. And one cannot sail the seas just by staring at the water. Go Lakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, guys, so sorry, but we do not have time for the um, Q&A audience because uh, we actually are past time. But, you know, the, like I said, you know, stay engaged and, and continue to have these conversations with your respective groups and, and, you know, as O'Shea said and everyone else on this panel said, be active, be active, um, you know, self-educate yourself and see how you can really make a difference. And we are all part of the solution. Um, so thank you so much for coming out and spending the time to, to listen to all these wonderful people. Thank you.